Good morning. How are you guys doing this morning? You feel good? Awake and alive is Jesus Lord. Wow, you guys are not awake. All right, so it's either that or you don't know the gospel. I'm just kidding. So I, hey, church, I am so excited. Uh, we are finishing up our, it's a mini three-week series. Anybody know what it's called? Imago Day, which means what? Man, this is great. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the ability to learn Image of God. So we have the last two weeks, we've talked about a few things. Next week, we are going to have Danny with us. I'm so excited for the word that she has for our faith family. The week after that, we are going to start a new series called Let Me Tell You a Story. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking through the parables and the stories of Jesus for a few months. And we're going to be just looking at a different one each week and dialoguing and figuring out how this applies to our lives and what Jesus really was trying to say to us as a culture. Last week, though, two weeks ago, we talked about Imago Dei and why it matters. And why does Imago Dei matter? Because being created in the image of God means that you were, I was created in the image of God, right? We were, as a culture, as like our, like our faith family, the, the Orlando, the, our neighbors, our coworkers, the people we interact with on a daily basis, each one of them is made in the image of God. And then lastly, they were made in the image of God, which is everyone else is around the world in places that we will never go and we will never see or interact with. But each one of them is just as valuable as you and I are, and they are made in the image of God. Imago Dei matters because we matter. Amen? All right, and then last week we talked about Imago Dei and, and specifically the image and what this looks like, right? The image of God. So us as humans are made in the image of God and being that we were marked by God, God marked us, he created us for a purpose. We were marked, but then sin entered and marred us, if you remember, right? We were marred by sin, but then we have been remade through Jesus, amen? Amen. We have been remade, we have been, see, Satan has tried to take our, God, our, our image that is made in God and help tr uh, cause us to form an image made on him, and that's what sin does. Sin causes us to look like we're made in the image of the devil. But then Jesus came and paid that price, and we have been remade into the image that we were created, and that's in God's image. Amen? You guys good? Today we are going to talk about, we are going to focus on the we part of we are made in the image of God. Everyone say we. We, we are made in the image of God. We are made in the image of God. If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, grab it. If you don't have a Bible and you would like one, if you could raise your hand, we'll have an usher bring one to you. Otherwise, stand to your feet and we'll have it on the screen as well. Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 1, and we're going to start in verse 26. Somebody say, let's do this. Let's do this. Then God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. There's some creepy things on this earth, aren't there? I don't know if you guys have ever watched Animal Planet. Oh, man. God help us. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. If you guys would pray, Father, help us. God, I pray that we would walk out of here with a greater sense of what being made in the image of you looks like and how that transposes over to community. Speak to us. Holy Spirit, speak to us and transform our lives forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Give somebody a fist bump as you sit down. And if it's not an exploding fist bump, it's not cool enough. <laughs> Someone's like, what's an exploding fist bump? I do it with my daughter and a few other people. Like Brandon, he and I do it all the time. Anyone feel like they have a bit of an independent streak to their lives? Like independence? 
Like, I can do this, right? I don't need help. I, I kind of do, right? I don't know if any of you guys, you guys might be much more holy than I am, but I, I tend to want to do things by myself, and I tend to not want to ask for help, right? My daughter's the same way, unfortunately, um, which, I mean, most humans are, but my daughter, her name is Emmy. She is precious. She is, most of you guys in here know her, at least have seen her. She tends to run in and go, Daddy! And run right to me. And every single time I do that, I feel like I just won the lottery. You know, it's like one of those moments like, oh, yes, that's my daughter, you know. And, uh, but, but Emmy, though, growing up, and I've, it's funny, when, as a parent, so I'm a newer parent. I've only been a dad for four, a little over four years now. And, um, and I have four kids, though, now. So, yeah, do the math. Um, so we, we, yeah, my wife and I are fruitful. Thank you, babe. So, um, so as a parent, you have the privilege though of seeing characteristics and traits of humans as adults. It's just way more obvious than kids, you know? So you see, you're like, oh, wow, I can't believe you're like that. And then you go, oh, wait, I'm like that. You know, it's just not as obvious, you know? So with Emmy, is you know, very much, she'll, she'll be like, no, 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 daddy, no, daddy, let me do this. I'm going to do this. So like buckling herself in a car seat. So in my wife's van, we have these car seats. They're a lot easier to buckle. So Emmy learned to buckle herself, for example. And so she loves it. She hops in the car, hops back there, buckles herself up and goes, I buckled myself. You know, like, okay, you did great. Awesome. Praise be to Emmy. And then we go. And then she comes into my car, though. And my car is a little bit more challenging. And the first few times that she'd come to my car, like, it just didn't click. And she'd be like, no, Daddy, let me do this. I can buckle myself. And I would start to buckle. And she'd be like, no, 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 no. Let me buckle. I can do this myself. And I'm like, okay, babe, you got this, you know. And then sure enough, she's sitting there trying to buckle it. And she does this cute thing. She got it from my grandmother. It was weird as that is. Genetics is wild. But my grandmother does this, this thing when she focuses with her mouth. And Emmy does the same thing. And it looks something like this. Not even joking. So she sits there and she goes, and she's trying to buckle it. And I'm, it's so awesome and ugly at the same time. But I love her and she's beautiful and it's just an ugly face. So, um, and so we, we, she goes and she's buckling up. She's trying to do this. And all of a sudden, you know, after like 20, 30 seconds, you can just see her start to lose like this like face of joy. And she's starting to realize defeat. And, 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 and at, at this moment, she will eventually turn to me and go, Daddy, I can't do this. I need you to do this, right? Really cute moment, and I get to do it for her, and that's awesome. Uh, and I want her to be able to learn and try, and I get that. But there's other times where she'll grab a cup of water and be like, no, Daddy, let me fill up the cup of water. And I'm like, just don't spill. And she'll be like putting ice in, and ice is exploding all over the floor. And you're like, I love you so much. You know, it's those moments. I'm, I'm a particular parent. I'm OCD, so I'm like, no, you know. And, uh, but it's, it's great. So, but we as humans, though, human nature, let's be honest. If we're going to be honest with ourselves, we tend to, like, tend to have that streak with ourselves as well. But here's why, though. We have lived in a culture that says, when you need help, you're weak, right? Like, that's literally what we are taught growing up. If you need help, you're weak. It's a sign of weakness if you have to ask for help, and that is just not true. <laughs> it is just, it unfortunately is the lie of sin, one of the many, but it is a lie of sin nature that if you need help, you're weak when actually, in essence, we're going to learn today that it's the exact opposite. This week, I want us to focus on this. You know, I, it's so funny. Emmy is smart, and she is, she is literally, I mean, really, really smart. If, you, if you've had a conversation with Emmy, you're like, wow, she's pretty smart. She's very, very smart. Um, and and she's, like, she's like witty, and she has a lot of potential, and I know God has called her to do a lot of great things, and I'm expectant of it, but the reality of it is, if she doesn't allow people to come alongside of her, especially right now in the season, her parents, and help her, she's never really going to live up to her full potential, right? And so we, we sit there, as, human, as humans, it's like, oh, man, as adults even, we sit, we tend to feel like at some point in time, we've got this, and I no longer need help. I no longer need people to come alongside of me. I'm an adult. I'm a big boy, you know? Emmy always says, I'm like, Emmy, I'm like, Emmy, how did you, how did you do that? And she's like, because I'm a big girl, you know? And she, we have this mentality, though, where it's like, I'm a big boy, I'm a big girl, I've got this, you know? And it's, all, it's a lie from the enemy, and he uses it as a tactic because he knows it'll keep us from realizing our full potential. And it's happened ever since the Garden of Eden. You know, back in the, in the early, early times, the Garden of Eden, if you guys are aware of the story, 
Uh, we have, you know, God creates Adam, Adam, right? And he, he makes him, and he makes him, of course, in the image of God. And, um, and he takes Adam, and then he, um, he realizes, though, like, Adam, he's, it's not right for you to be alone. So he makes Eve, and he makes this Adam and Eve couple, and they're great. And he literally, you know, he, get, he gives them freedom in the garden to do anything they want. And he has one rule. And what's that one rule? Right? Don't eat from the, that, this one tree. You can eat from all the other trees, every single, this one tree. You know that, like, you had one job. Like, this was Adam and Eve. Like, you had one job that you weren't supposed to do. And, you know, sure enough, you did it. And, and so they get to this point, though. They get to this point where they realize, like, hey, you know what? God's plan, I get this, but I'm going to take matters into my own hands. And I'm, I'm going to, you know, end up biting from this apple. But what's funny, though, is is, you know, Eve, the serpent leads Eve to take a bite of the apple, tells her, like, hey, God, just trying to hold back from you, you know, don't, you know, he, he knows that you'll know what he knows if, you know, all that, convinces her to eat this fruit. She does it, and then she convinces Adam to eat the fruit. He does it, and God comes into places like, whoa, what's going on? He realizes that they've, they've done what they weren't supposed to do, God, even though God already knew, and he's like, man, what's, what happened? And, and who does Eve blame? Eve blamed the serpent, like, the serpent that you made, you know, caused me to do this, right? Now, but who does Adam blame? His wife, right? <laughs> like every horrible husband does. Like, the wife, God, that you gave me, let, you know, caught, so it's, this is clearly not my fault, right? We tend to, but here's what, it's, it's so sad, but ironic, and at the same time, we do the same thing. Adam is sitting there blaming the community that was supposed to, the, to help him reach his full potential. He's now pushing that community away. When he's cornered, when he's marred by sin, he's pushing, the, pushing Eve away from this, this, the wife that you gave me, Lord. See, the community that we should be running to for help, and Adam in this moment is pushing this community away. This is what sin does, guys. Sin divides. Sin causes us to be separate from the community. That, I would argue, and we'll tell you, and we'll look at more, more closely, that we arguably need in our lives we community the community that we were meant we were wired to have to help us be who God has called us to be to help us reach the full potential in what he created us to be see God in his very nature in his image in himself you see here in, in Genesis 1 he said we he made man in whose image what is the word that he uses our image who's he talking about the trinity which is father son and what the Holy Ghost, right? Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, the Trinity. God in his very nature, in his image from the beginning has demonstrated community. He's demonstrated a life, doing life together with community to even live up to his full potential. God very much could have done that by himself, right? God very much could have had himself, not manifested himself in, a, in the Trinity and just done it out by himself. But I fully believe that he did it as an example and when he created us in his image, he created us with the wiring of needing what in our lives? Community. Community. It's in God's nature. We are made in the image of God, imago Dei. It is in our nature. And I will argue that all day long. <laughs> created in the image of God. Church, the big idea of this message is simple today. You will never live up to your full potential, right? You will never live out the plan that God has for your life without the people that God has in your life. I'm gonna say this again. You will never live out the plan, for, a plan, of, plan that God has for your life without the people of God in your life. And this is not just, listen, it's the people of God. I'm not saying that we don't associate with those who don't know Jesus. We are called to go do that. But I'm talking about your direct community, your closest, your confidants, the people that are in your life that you literally do life with on a regular basis who know you inside and out. Those people, if they are not God's people, that is not the right community. I want us to look at a biblical relationship today. We're going to look at a relationship in the Bible, and, and the relationship is between Saul or Paul and Barnabas. Everyone say Barnabas. Barnabas. Saul and Barnabas. And we're going to look at this and see how it powerfully demonstrates this idea. 
But before we get to that, though, there's one. I want to clarify the most important truth. I want to clarify what is the most important and crucial point of this message. And this is wildly revolutionary. And I'm not going to lie. I'm pretty proud of this point. I think this is life-changing. It's going to blow your minds when you see these words pop up on the screen. But the first point of the message is simple, and it's this. God has a plan. Is it going to pop up there? Oh, there it is. God has a plan. Isn't that revolutionary? I mean, it's life. I mean, come on, somebody. It's life changing, right? This is like, oh man, I've never heard that before. Well, I'm glad you have now because the truth is God has a plan for your life. Not just for us, for you and for me. God has a plan for your life, church. I'm not sure what your background is, but if you're in here this morning and you're breathing and you're alive, God has a plan that has not been fulfilled in your life and it's for you. And so it is a plan that only you can fulfill and it's a plan that you are supposed to fulfill and that's why you're still alive today. See, according to the Bible, God has these amazing plans for our lives and and, and he has called us, and we see it over and over and over again in Scripture. We're going to look at a few verses of how we see this, but I need you guys to know, if the only thing that you walk out of here today with is that God has a plan for your life, that's still a win. God has a plan for your life, and here's the reality of it. If I were to create an engine, and if I were to make this engine, most likely I made this engine with a purpose, right? So if that engine's like, man... God made me, but he doesn't have a plan for me. Like this, Troy made me this, but you know what? I don't really feel like being an engine. I want to be a flower, and I just want to sit here, you know? But if God made us, I would argue with you, God made you with a purpose, and he has a plan for your life, just like that engine would. Amen? Jeremiah 1.5, look at this. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Now he's talking directly to Jeremiah, all right? He is talking to someone specific in this Bible, but God is not gonna do something in someone's life that he wouldn't do in other people's lives. I can tell you that God knew you when he formed you in your mother's womb too. Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. I know the plans I have for you. Ah, God has a plan, Ephesians 2.10, for he, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for what? For good works, which God prepared beforehand, beforehand that we should walk in them. Church, God has a plan for you. He has a plan. The last one I'll do is Hebrews 10.36, and there is countless more. For you have need of endurance, so when you have done the will of God, when you have done the will of God for your life, God's plan for your life, when you have done it, not even if, when you have done the will of God for your life, you may receive what is promised. If you're a follower of Jesus, can we all agree that we serve a Jesus, a God who is more smart than any other person? Can we agree that he's a good father? He's a loving father. He loves you deeply. I mean, are we, amen? Are we all in agreement on this? So then who better to create a plan for our lives? It's God. It's his plan for your life, for my life. He's got a plan for our lives. When we look at this biblical passage. We're gonna look at it in a moment. But we come to, um, if you guys wanna flip over to Acts We're going to look at Paul, who was Saul. Now, if you guys know the story of Saul, and we're going to to refer to him as Saul right now, Saul, whose name eventually changed to Paul, was a very well-known, high-up official in the religious world back in this time. He was a religious leader among the Jews. He was well-versed in the scriptures. He was trained. He was was educated. He, He even just had a lot of respect of a lot of the religious authorities back in this time. All right, so he is, he's high up on the totem pole. He is very, very high up in the religious world totem pole. And Jesus comes, you know, kind of wrecks everybody, does his whole deal, dies on the cross, goes down to the grave, rises, 
then leaves the church and says, hey church, I'm gonna send you someone else, you know, the, the Holy Spirit that's gonna be with you. I'm gonna go be with my father. Jesus goes up in heaven. He's, with, he's on the right hand of God now at the throne. Sends the Holy Spirit down. That's when Pentecost happens in Acts. Then from Acts, the early church f- begins. And it basically, kind of, the wheel starts going and the very first churches began. And these churches were in homes. They were in temples. They met regularly. They did all these things, right? Now, but what these, these churches are doing though is these churches are reaching the community around them and the gospel is spreading oh slowly but surely boom 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 throughout all of asia as this is happening though you better believe it the religious leaders are like no way we are not going to let this happen so they are because they're preaching a different doctrine than what they kind of align themselves with as jewish people as the israelites and they had not believed that the savior had come back yet so they didn't believe jesus was a savior so they're pushing back and they're thinking that this is rebellion to god and they are now it's causing them to persecute So now they're not only just like pushing back with their words, but now they're harming these people. They're killing these people. They're murdering them. They're literally doing whatever they can to stop this movement. Paul, I should say Saul, was at the top of this list. He, I mean, he was, he was one of the greats. He was, he was murdering, telling people to murder, killing, persecuting. He was essentially a religious terrorist is what he was at this time. And so he is, he's doing this, he's doing this whole deal, and he comes to Acts chapter nine, and all of a sudden, Saul, whom he's on his way to a place called Damascus, and he gets blinded, boom, on the spot. Jesus shows up, blinds him with his light. Now he's with other people, and these other people that he was with did not see what, what Paul saw, what Saul saw. And, um, and, he's, and he's there, and then all of a sudden, Jesus speaks and goes, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And everyone heard him. So even though the other people around didn't see, they heard the powerful voice of God, the audible voice of Jesus. He's like, why are you persecuting me? He's like, who are you, Lord? And he says Lord, but he's not meaning like Lord of Lords. He's, he, he just knows this is a powerful being. And he's like, man, I am Jesus who you are persecuting. You need to stop, you know? And he sends him to the city. And what's crazy though, is in Acts chapter nine, six, what so says this, he goes, but rise, this is right in this moment, but rise and enter the city and you will be told what you are to do. And this is the beginning of Saul who became Paul's relationship with Jesus, right here. He's been a God person his whole life, but the savior of the world, this is where he initiated it. Now what's cool though, Saul, Paul was a wild religious terrorist who we would, honestly, in this time and days, we would be like, they've got no hope. They need to rot in hell. You know, like that would be, unfortunately, our thought process because hate breeds hate, right? And so it naturally would flow out of us of like, man, if I don't look at this person as being made in the image of God, I'm gonna look at them through the lenses of sin and I hope they burn in hell. You know, that, that's what we do, if we're gonna be honest. So, but when we take that lens off, we put on the lens that God gave us and wired us to have sin. This is still one of God's creation. This is one made in the image of God. This is Saul. And Saul got rocked by God and begins his journey. He begins his journey, right? And so God had an incredible plan. What we come to find out, Paul is one of the most influential people of all time. He he wrote many, many books in the New Testament that we study, that we abide in, that we memorize and we live our lives by in reverence of Christ. He's a wildly influential person. But what's crazy though, what we don't fully recognize is it almost didn't happen. So God blinds him on the street, says go to the city and you'll you'll get told what to do. He does and some crazy things happen and then he gets slowly plugged into these disciples and we come to Acts chapter nine, verses 26 to 28 and this is what it says. When he had come to Jerusalem, very beginning, he's new, he gave his life to Jesus, he got his sight back. He's like, okay, I'm ready to start following you, Lord. I'm not gonna persecute you anymore. I'm surrendering my life to you. And he comes to Jerusalem. He attempted to join the disciples and they were all afraid of him. No surprise there. This is a religious terrorist who they were all very well aware of. They were all afraid of him. I mean, you can imagine, right? I can, <laughs> you can imagine Paul walking and being like, what's up, my brothers? You know, <laughs> hey, I'm here, high fives. And they're all just like, whoa, what's going on here? Yesterday, you were literally killing us. And you're coming in here trying to act all cool. You know, I'm sure he didn't, Paul was really humble. But that's like like to imagine it in that sense. Coming in ready, ready to just connect. And, and I, I'm sure though he's insecure and not, sure, not really sure what's going on. He's like, I, I, I know that they're gonna hate me. I know that. Like they're gonna, like h- how are they even gonna accept me? I was literally killing their friends yesterday and the day before. And it's wild though, because Barnabas in verse 27 took him 
and brought him to the apostles and declared to them on how the road he had seen the Lord who spoke to him and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. And so he went in and out among them at Jerusalem preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. God knew that in order for Paul, I need you guys to get this, in order for Paul to be who God had called him to be, God knew he needed community. He, did, he knew it. And so even though the community initially rejected him, was like, ah, it was amazing that Barnabas, let's call him Barney, all right, our boy Barney. So Barney comes in and he's like, hey, I'm going to take you under my wing. I see something in you. I think the Holy Spirit is telling me to do this, right? Barnabas is being sensitive to God's spirit, took him underneath his wing, even though the other disciples rejected him in that moment. And he takes him from there. And this is where the journey begins. Can I just say, guys, don't get surprised if you're following, trying to follow Jesus and some community rejects you. Can we just like stop acting surprised by things? One of the greatest, by the way, marriage advice, one of the greatest bits of a marriage advice that we got was expect the unexpected. Like that, that was like the marriage council was like, hey, listen, the reality of it is the unexpected will happen. So just expect it. So you're not caught off guard. I'm like, huh, okay. So then Heather and I have navigated through our marriage of like when something sideswipes us and we're on the floor like, whoa, like how did that just happen? We're like, oh, well, we knew it was going to happen. We just didn't know what it would look like, right? Like expect the unexpected. The reality is we get into Christian groups, and this is why Christian, one of the many reasons why Christians have a bad rap. We're human. We wrestle with our flesh. We have sin. We're marred by sin, and we're at war. The Bible says we're battling with our spirit that's trying to follow Jesus is battling our flesh that is trying to follow the enemy, right? Get selfishly follow ourselves, which is what Satan does. And so we're wrestling that. And we wonder that when Christians act a certain way, we're like, how can a Christian do that? You know, it was, it was funny. There was, I was talking with Pastor Mike, who's the lead pastor of our Gainesville church, the main parental church, if you would. And I was talking with him this past week, and he's like, you know, we had a lady come into our church because the, if you've ever been to the hub in Gainesville, it has like one exit, and so the traffic on the way out is horrendous. Um, and so they, there's a church next door to them too. It's a much smaller church. And so this lady comes in like fuming after service and she's just like, where's the pastor? I want to talk to him, you know? And, 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 and he, he's like, she walks up and he's like, hey, I'm the pastor here. And, and she's like, you need to tell your, your church to start acting more like Christians. <laughs> and it's like, oh man. And, and, and he's like, okay, well, what, well, like, what do you mean? He's like, well, I was trying to pull out and for, for church, you know, after I left church and a ton of people from your church, wouldn't, they wouldn't let me in. Like, they were just cutting me off, and they wouldn't let me in. And he's like, I am so sorry, you know, and we, they talk through it and all this stuff. And I'm listening to this, and I'm like, man, we all do this. Like, we all get in this spot where we're like, oh, why don't you act more like a Christian, you know? And, like, and, we, we, and yes, it is frustrating when someone doesn't let you in. But what's, what's wild, though, is, let, let's be honest, the other thought is, I'm so thankful that people come to our church who are not Christian, so like, what, what, it's like sitting here like, hey, start acting like Christians. Maybe those people pulling out weren't Christian, but maybe they are. The chances probably were high that they are because Christians still live in sin. Like we still sin and mess up and we still are rude and we still are uh, aggressive and we still get prideful and we still, I'm driving sometimes and I'm like, I'm not letting this guy in. I don't know if you guys have ever done this. And I'm like, dang, this guy's trying to get in. I'm, I'm not letting him in. I'm gonna speed up just fast enough to let him in. And then later I'm like, oh man, Lord, <laughs> that was so prideful. I repent. I don't, so we, we get in these moments where we still act out because of our sin. We can't, so can we stop getting surprised when Christians do that? Can we stop getting surprised when we feel like we have some, a calling from the Lord? And we're like, man, God's called me to do this. And a few Christians in your life are like, nah, that's not from the Lord. And you're like, wait, may, maybe it's not from the Lord, but no, I think this is. They're wrong. Like, how can they not see this? You know, like we get, we get caught off guard. And it's like, okay, guys, our hearts are deceptive. The Bible tells us that our hearts are deceptive. We are marred by sin and we are being remade in the image of Christ, right? So we have been, so biblical, you know, terminology here, we have been justified when we accept Christ. We are justified. We are no longer held accountable for the sins that we have committed or will ever commit. When we die, we go to heaven, right? That's what the Bible teaches. If you surrender your life to Jesus because of what he did on the cross, we are justified so that when God looks at us, he sees Christ, right? The purity and the holiness of Christ. But that also doesn't mean, though, that we're not still sinning and messing up. And so we are now in the process of sanctification, which is being made into the likeness of God, into holiness. So sanctific this process of sanctification. But that means we still mess up. We still, we still fall short. We don't hear clearly from the Lord, right? We talked about it a few, like several weeks ago. Like, I, I wish we would stop saying such powerful phrases like, God said this. Because I'm like, man... Number one, those are like the two most powerful words you can ever put together is God said, because that's what created the whole universe, right? <laughs> God spoke the universe in existence, right? The big bang. And so it's like, okay, if you're gonna say God said, 
man, you, be, you better be right. Like, you better believe that. That's re- like, you better know that's exactly what he said. And if you didn't hear the audible voice of God, you're not 100% positive that's what God said. So how about we sm- say things more like, it seems like the Holy Spirit is telling me, right? That we're, in the, we're in this journey where our flesh can say things and it seems godly. We're in this journey where the enemy's gonna say things. You know the enemy knows scripture? Crazy. He tempted Jesus and he, he spit scripture at Jesus when he, when he was tempting Jesus. And Jesus returned scripture and returned battled, fight fire with fire, right? What an encouraging story. But man, the enemy can even spit stuff at you. The right, or the right thing, the most godly thing at the wrong time is still the wrong thing. I need you guys to understand, I'm, I'm spitting out a bunch of things here, but I need us to know, can we stop being surprised when things don't always go as planned when we're following the Lord? Because they're not going to. And this is what, what's wild here. This brings us to our second point of the message because I'm, I'm thankful that Barnabas was sensitive to what God was doing and, and took Paul under his wing because it, it, it shaped Paul and helped lead him into his ministry. If it weren't for Barnabas, I would question, I would wonder if Paul actually ever would have became the Paul that he was supposed to be. And I doubt it, I doubt he would have. And it makes me wonder, man, how many Pauls and Sauls are around us today that are waiting to be activated by God some of you in this room today are, gonna, are, are meant to do great things, far greater than all the rest of us in this room for the God's kingdom. And, and, and listen, we're all meant to do great things for God's kingdom. Don't get me wrong. But in the worldly sense, like Paul was like re-influenced a, a lot more people than I'll ever influence, right? And that's okay. Like for God's glory, we're all, doing, we're all working for God's glory and we're all playing our part. But man, some of you are meant to do amazing things for the gospel. And what's holding you back is you're just not plugged into community. Some of, so how many people around us are, are, uh, that we've interacted with or have not interacted with yet that are waiting to be activated in a community and are just not living up to the full potential that they have? Which brings me to our second point. So God, first point is what? God has a plan, right? Revolutionary, the most important point. The second point is this. So God's plan involves a clan. You like that rhyming there? That was good. God's plan involves a clan. What's a clan? Tell me the definition of a clan. People you belong, you have like-minded, right? People like-minded that connect, that, that belong, you belong together. You are your clan, you're your family, right? God's plan involves a clan. So Barnabas, he vouches for Paul and he, and he begins to activate Paul. Now here's what I'd like to note though. It was three to five years after Barnabas took Paul under his wing to where actually Paul was activated for the gospel. Three to five years some of you are like, man, I know that God has a big plan for my life, and I know I'm supposed to be doing this, but I'm just not quite there yet. God, when are you going to open up the door? Some, I, some of you might be like, feel called to the mission field, and you're like, when am I going to get on the mission field? It's taking forever, Lord. And God's like, hey, trust the plan that I have for your life. You know, I remember when I was, when I was working my job, feeling a call to ministry, um, knowing that I was going to eventually end up back in full-time ministry, and I'm working this, you know, this, this job in sales, and, and a lot, some days, really, really disliking what I do. And, I'm, and I just come home like, man, Lord, I'm ready. Just take me now. Like, what is the holdup? Clearly, you're not getting this here, Lord. Like, I want to go now. <laughs> Are you listening? I mean, we, get, we get discouraged very easily. Paul, it was three to five years when Barnabas took Paul under his wing, taking a leap of faith, not knowing if Paul was going to eventually go back to where he was, but he knew and he trusted in the Lord. And Barnabas was a man of God and he was community to Paul and he took him under his wing and he invested in him. He invested in him. He invested in him. And three to five years later, Paul eventually is activated. Paul became one of the most influential people. How many Pauls, guys, are out there? How many Pauls are in this place right now? Some of you guys are waiting to be activated. And I know. And just continue waiting. Don't give up. Please don't give up. Trust in the Lord. Trust the plan he has for your life. But if you're not in community, if you're not connected to community, if, you're not, if you don't have a Barnabas above you who's investing in you, who's challenging you, who's encouraging you, who's praying for you, man, get under Barnabas's. Barney's, right? Find a Barney. Find a Barney. You know, I remember it, it, I, I played basketball, right? So I, I want to just specifically say going to church and going to a microchurch doesn't mean you're, doesn't mean you're activated. You can very much be on a team, you can make a team, and you can play the bench the whole time. So if, you are, if you're going to play sports, right, and like, that doesn't mean you're, you're actually participating and giving to the team if you're just on the bench. I mean, all you can do is kind of be like, hey, 
good shot, you know, great job, run back, you know. That's about all you got, which is about what we do at church a lot of times, right? We come to church, and we sit there, and we kind of shout things, or we say things, or we're like, hey, man, so good to see you. Hey, I'm praying for you. Hey, I'm doing that. Oh, it's awesome, man, great, it's great. And then we go out, though, and we're really not doing much. We're really not actually living out the calling that God has for our lives. And we go throughout our weeks, and we're riding the bench. I remember I, so I went from Canada, born and raised in Ottawa, Canada. If you didn't know that about me, I am Canadian. And we, uh, now I'm American too, green card marriage, thank you, Lord, love. So um, it just happens that we love each other too. It worked out. So just kidding. All right, not really. So we, um, <laughs> I got to be careful, this is videoed. So, um, so we, so we got, we got uh, wow, whew, bring that back. So we moved down here. I played basketball. My whole family was really into basketball, and we were really good. Like, we were really, in Canada especially, because the caliber of basketball is not as high. So we were, like, top in our city, like, really, really good. And that's not saying a whole lot up there, right? So that's why I'm able to say this. But we were. So when we left, like, all of our school's coaches were like, no, you know. So we come down here, and I, I come down here as a freshman in, in high school, just in time for basketball tryouts. I go to tryout, one tryout. They don't even look at me. I get cut. Boom. Humiliating. You're just like, oh, my goodness. The guy that, like, the people that made it past me to the second round were horrible. And you're like, oh, it's so humbling, you know. At the time, I didn't say it with that attitude. I was a little frustrated. But now I'm able to look back and be like, that was a really humbling moment for me. But what happened, though, is it ended up beating my confidence down. So then I spent the next two years, I, made, I of course, made the team the next year, but then I rode the bench. Then in my junior year, I'm still on the JV team riding the bench my whole junior year, Right. And I'm like, man, I feel like I can be a better player. I, f I know I can be a better player. I'm just not living it out. And in my junior year, we got a new coach that came in. Amazing coach. He saw something in me. And I remember him coming up to me. He's like, hey, you're not playing to your potential. Like, we're going to start activating this. And I'm like, oh, okay. So he starts calling it out, speaking to me, investing in me, doing drills with me. He, I mean, really raising me up, right? So that's during the summer before our senior year. We come to our senior year in high school. And I'm not starting, but I'm on varsity. And the guy that's starting in front of me, the very first game gets injured. So then the coach is like, subs me, and he goes, he's like, hey, it's your time. And he like, he just, I remember, he's like, it's your time, go get it. And I get in the court, and I had this level of confidence because he believed in me, you know? Like he, he believed in me, he invested in me, and he called it out to me, and he's like, hey, it's your time to go shine. And sure enough, I played pretty well. I did pretty, really well, I'm not gonna lie. And I played really, really well. We won that game, ended up starting every single game for the rest of the season. And our team was really good. We ended up making it to the top eight in the state for 6A. So, like, we were really, really good in basketball. Now, from there, though, then he's like, hey, you should play college ball. And he's like, I can get you to a college scholarship, and you go to college basketball here and do this and this. And I'm sitting there listening to him. I'm like, two years ago, last year, I was benching on JV. Wild, right? And now I'm starting on varsity, and you're talking to me about college basketball. Listen, guys, it wasn't, nothing shifted on my ability. Nothing shifted on my genetics. You know what shifted? the community around me. I had someone in my life that was like, hey, you can do this. I'm gonna, I see this in you. I'm going to raise you up to be who you're called to be. Now, it's a little bit more spiritual. He didn't say it that way. But it's like, church, the reality of it is, for you guys, man, you have a plan. God knows. He formed you in his womb. He created you. He has a purpose for your life. He knows how he knitted you in your mother's womb. And he, the reason why you're alive is because he's going to use you in a mighty way not to ride the bench, he wants you in the game, actually living it out, actually participating, actually playing a part in the kingdom of God on earth here. That is you. That is you. You have that calling in your life, but you will never, ever live the full potential of that out and possibly will probably just stay on the bench if you never get a clan, if you never get a community. God's plan has a clan, guys. You will never discover the plan of, for, of God for your life without the people of God in your life. Why? Because we're made in his image. So Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, and let's consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Guys, I, I watched this documentary called Sheep Among Wolves. Amazing, amazing documentary. Um, and it's essentially going over, going, uh, talking about the church over in the Middle East, where it's, it's illegal, where they're persecuted, where ISIS is really dominant. And it was talking about how revival is starting to stir up. And I actually haven't watched the next one. You can go on YouTube and watch both of these documentaries. Write it down. There's a bulletin, pen on your chair. Write it down. You will forget it if you don't. But there is a, there is, it's called Sheep Among Wolves. 
You, you, you can watch part one. Volume one came out three years ago. It's an hour long. Part two came out two days ago, two nights ago, and it's an hour and 50 minutes. It's like a movie. We watch a lot of movies. You can watch this. I promise you it'll be worth it. Sheep among wolves. So the first documentary is just talking about the persecution of the church, and it's, it's eye-opening, right? And you're like, man, I, they're literally, like, there are people who put their lives on the line every single day to not even just be a Christian, but to try and go help other people find Jesus. And they're, but they're doing it, though, joyfully. They're like, yeah, like one of the ladies was like, yeah, there's a good chance that we'll get captured, and if ISIS captures us and we, knows we're a Christian, which they will, that they're going to rape me, and then they're going to kill me. Those, that's the two things they, th- they throw out there. And, and, and this lady's like, you know, but it's for the joy set before me. Like, if this is what God has called me to do, my body is a living sacrifice for him. And that, like that, I, I, I will joyfully give my body for his glory. And it was like this shocking moment. I sat in my seat, and, I'm like, and I was talking with Heather. I'm like, oh my goodness. We have no idea what that's like. We literally have no clue. Our, 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 our thing is, oh man, I woke up. I only got eight hours of sleep last night. I really need nine. I'm just going to sleep an extra hour. It's okay. I can miss church today. <laughs> our problem is... Um, I got a little bit of a cold. I had a long week. I'm tired. I'm just going to miss community tonight at microchurch. It's okay. It's not a big deal. Our problem is, oh, man, if I go and share the gospel with my, with my coworker here, they might think differently of me. Dang. Yeah, I'm not going to do this. You see, like, completely different world. And you know what the guy in the video says? He goes, could you imagine if these people came to our country <laughs> and we're, like, we're, we're sharing the gospel in our country, the difference that their lives would be? Their li- they're, they're, literally every single day, they're like, we leave the house knowing there's a chance we won't come back through this door today. Like, we won't. But it's worth it because Jesus is worth it. It's worth it because his hope is worth it. And how selfish can I be if I'm not gonna do everything in my power to get this world out, word out there? How selfish can I be? My body is not my own. My body is not my own. It's a living sacrifice for God's glory. God, whatever you want me to do, whatever you want me to do. Not neglecting to meet together is the habit of some. Man, church, my prayer is, listen, you don't have to, do I, Detroit, do I need to go to, Christian, to go to church to be a Christian? No. Do I need to go to my church to be a Christian? No. But do I need to be in community to be a Christian? Yes. <laughs> need to be an effective follower of Jesus? You need to be in community. Now that can involve Sundays, that can involve microchurch. God willing, that involves more than just those two. God willing, you're striving every bit of energy that you have to connect with community who are gonna pray for you. You're gonna get under Barnabases that are gonna be under you or over you and you're gonna be a Barnabas to someone under you and you're gonna continue investing the gospel and living out the plan that God has for your life. God forbid you don't do that. Proverbs 18.1 Whoever isolates himself seeks his own desire. He breaks out against all sound judgment. I've seen it over and over again, guys. People who, long, who, who have desires to be connected, but then they isolate themselves. Whatever the reason may be. Oh, Troy, it's too far to drive to microchurch. You know, oh, I might have to stay up a little bit later. I get that. That's fine. Find some other means of community, but don't just stop there. And you know, ah, man, I, like, I'm really, you know, I'm just not, like, I'm in a season where I'm really busy. When Heather and I had twins, you better believe we were busy. <laughs> we had twins after having two young kids. One of our kids has a delay, and, and we have twins now that are 10 months. I mean, God, we made it 10 months. Thank you, Lord. So we have these twins, and it's like, man, I remember the tension, the, the tendency was when they were born was to recluse. You know what? Ah, right now we just need to be as a family and we need to, like, we just need to make this on our own and just survive. And it was like this recluse, which we all do. And you know what's wild? I'm so thankful we pushed past that. Heather and I, every single time we've had a kid, we, re- we push very quickly to get out of that shell because we're like, no, we know that the hardest times are when we are most separated from community. And so we pushed out of those shells and we're like, hey, this is us. We need help, (laughs) but we're not going to just hide. And I'm telling you, literally, the the greatest moments and the greatest times of this season have been when we've had you guys and our families surround us and support us. And it's been, I mean, so what? Some of you in this room have done so much to help us in this season, and Heather and I are eternally grateful for it. But that you guys in those moments are being Barnabas, you're taking us under your wings and helping us. Listen, that we need that, you need that. So whatever your reason is that you want to isolate yourself, Know that that is not of God's voice in your life. 
He never wants you to be isolated. We will set up logical reasons as to why. I started a new job. I'm just busy. I'm working like 65 hours a week. I don't really have time for this. Well, if you don't have time for that, you're in a big problem. You have, a, you have an issue right now. You need to navigate. Find community. Your, God's plan for your life, it involves a clan in your life. You need a clan. 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. The enemy is real. You know, what, you know what they call in Africa? You know what they call someone wandering around by themselves? Lion food. Yeah, literally. You, by yourself, you are vulnerable to, God, to, to, the, to the enemy. You're vulner, vulnerable. And the enemy is real. The enemy exists to still steal, kill, and destroy your life. That's literally his purpose. He will deceive you till the ends of the earth and try and make you think that that's not what he's doing, but he is out to destroy your life and he will take everything from you. Church, you've got it. You cannot, you cannot be blinded. The way we are not blinded by the lies of the earth is we remind ourselves of the truths of scripture. We cannot be by ourselves we cannot be alone. We need community, and not just any community. We need godly community. Some of you recently, I talked to some of you guys recently, have gotten plugged in a microchurch, and you're like, my life is forever changed. I have people around me now praying for me, who are loving me, who are connecting me throughout the week, and know, like, reminding me to seek the Lord, to spend time with God, to connect with my Heavenly Father, challenging me to go out and be a light to those around me. You know what the most fulfilling times in Troy's life are? When people around me give their life to Jesus. Like when, when I participated in seeing someone give their life to Jesus, eyes open, they see the, the goodness of God, and they're like, I want to give my life to you. You know what's wild? Troy doesn't naturally push for that. I need people around me to challenge me to do what I'm called to do. I need people that, that regularly remind me, Troy, are you making disciples? Are you being a Barney to someone under you as you have Barneys above you? The enemy is real. What do I do, Troy? What do I do? Run. <laughs> you guys seen the new Lion King? Run. And never return until you're ready for community. So, um, no, I'm kidding. No. But run. This, I, seriously, I'm serious. So run to God and to his people. If you're in this room, you're like, man, I feel distant from God. Well, how distant are you from community that's pushing you towards God? Troy, I, I, I'm just, I'm struggling, I'm, I'm challenged, I'm like, I know I'm called to do this, but I'm having a hard time getting the motivation to do that. Are you in community? Because I don't have the motivation without community. Like, I know I'm supposed to do more for the kingdom. Okay, get plugged into community that's gonna challenge and push you to that direction. Don't just find any community, though. All right, last point is this, and we'll wrap up. God's plan has a purpose. Look at this, Acts 9.31. What is the result of this Paul-Saul ordeal? So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. It what? Oh, it's not up there. It multiplied. <laughs> it multiplied. God has a plan for your life. The plan involves a clan and the plan has a purpose. You know what God's purpose is? To reach the world. So your plan, it participates in reaching the world, multiplying the church. The church is the gathering of God's people. This is what we are called to do. We are called to reach for the glory of God. 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will able to teach others. We're called to multiply, guys. Church, we are called to multiply, and my prayer is that we would multiply like the church God has called us to be. And that will only happen when each of us recognizes we have a purpose, we have a plan. God is, you're in this room today because God has a purpose for your life. And I'm not, beyond just being alive, you're here today for a specific reason. Maybe it's for this message. Maybe it's so that you, you're, you're empowered to go be more a part of what God's doing through this faith family. I don't, whatever the reason is, you're not in here by chance. You're here for a purpose. What is that purpose? God, what am I here for? What do you want me to do? Go multiply for God's glory. Teach them about the truths of God. He longs to see a church that multiplies itself with people who are, landing, who are living out the plan and the purpose for their lives. So the questions I want you asking is this. First question, who's the Barney in your life? Who's the Barnabas in your life? If you are following Jesus and you're alive and breathing, you should always strive to have Barneys above you. 
Always. You're never too old. You're never too young. You're never too mature. You always need people above you that will invest in you. Now, that doesn't always mean someone who's older than you, right? That could mean some, you just be looking for growth and discipleship of people who will cover you, pray for you, invest in your life, challenge you to go be who God has called you to be. Second point, question, who are you barneying? Who in your life has God called for you to take under your wing and in energy and time and prayers and invested in them? I want to see this person be who God's called them to be. One of my greatest callings, I feel like, from the Lord when I first really surrendered my life to Jesus was, was not to be someone great, was not to be like uh, always in the limelight. Honestly, I knew, like we're all called to this, but I feel like it's like a specific calling for my life is to help other people be who God has called them to be. And that's where I honestly get most joy. I, I get joy being up here talking with you guys. I get more joy when I see people activated in their gifts and start to live out what God has called them to do. It's like, oh, I could do this every day of my life for God's glory. The application get into community. <laughs> Troy, what do I do? Get into community. Troy, I'm in community. Are you really? Like, are you really in community? Or do you just come and sit? Do you just come and observe? Are you just coming to get a good feeling when you come here or go to microchurch? Are you going just to say hi to a few people and you just like, like being around people? No, no. Do people know you? Do they know the deepest, darkest parts of you? And are they praying for you? And are you praying for them? Are you investing in them? Are you you know, like trying to encourage them as they encourage you, as they challenge you to go be who God's called you to be. Get into, get into a microchurch. Somebody say amen. amen. Get into a microchurch, guys. If you're not in a microchurch, if you're visiting, you're like, what's a microchurch? It probably means you didn't pay attention earlier. But a microchurch is our small groups. It's our small groups. It's where, it's where we connect in a way where we actually go deep with one another. We've got mic five microchurches, I think, that meet on different days of the week. Man, guys, get into a microchurch. Get plugged in somewhere where you will be challenged, encouraged. Yes, it's worth sacrificing for. Yes, it's worth sacrificing one night a week of watching TV for. Yes, it's worth sacrificing driving 30 minutes, 40 minutes across town for. It is worth connecting with people for God's glory so that you can be who God has called you to be. I don't want you to come to me like four years down the road and be like, man, I've just wasted the last four years. Chances are you weren't in community if you did. If you're right now and you're like, man, Troy, I've been following Jesus for 10 years. The last few years, though, haven't really done much. You're not in community. I can guarantee that. Get into community. Get into a microchurch. Get into a microchurch. We are made for community, guys. We hunger for it. We're going to go to the wrong places for it. We're going we're gonna to seek it out in, in other friends. If your closest friends in your life don't love Jesus, they're dragging you down. I know that sucks to hear. If your closest friends in your life who you spend the most time with are not pointing you to Jesus, they're dragging you down. There's no lukewarm middle. It's not like, oh, I'm just maintaining. No, you're not. <laughs> I've said that too. We're not maintaining. You're, you're either going away from God or you're going towards him. Church, analyze your life. Where are you at? Where, where are your friends at? Where's your closest community at? Doesn't mean you forsake your friends that don't know Jesus. Absolutely not. If you're in here and you don't know Jesus, we're so thankful you're here. Doesn't mean you're not welcome here. You are more than welcome here and you're more than welcome in God's kingdom. But the reality is, we need, we are gonna be influenced highly by that. We are called to go out into the world to love, to have friends who don't know God and help them find him. But we've gotta have our anchor as the closest people in our lives that do know Jesus, that are holding us from getting caught up in the ways of the world. Last thing I'll say is this, Jeremiah 29, 11. I said the verse earlier, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, right? Plans for, uh, it, plans for welfare and not for evil to give you a future and a good hope to pay on your version. The, what's crazy about this though, and we said this a few months ago in one of the messages, this wasn't like, oh yeah, your life's gonna be great from here on out, Jeremiah. Like what, what really was this was, was like 70 years after, like of, of famine and of trials and tribulation and like, and just toil, like really, really challenging years for the people of that time. So what, God, were you lying? No. But this life, the Bible, we believe in the inerrancy of God's word. When, the God, when, God's, when he promises stuff like that, he does not at the same time promise that life will be easy. When God says, hey, I've got you, it doesn't mean that you're never gonna have a problem again. We live in a world full of sin. Sin breeds sickness, sin breeds disease, sin breeds death. It breeds hatred. We're gonna be surrounded by that. So we're gonna have these things affect us. The difference is we have a God that says he will carry us through every trial. 
We have a God that says he will carry us through every suffering, every pain, every hurt. He says he will be with us. He will carry us. And he will, in the midst of the trials and in the midst of the chaos, in the midst of the mess, he's still going to give us purpose and allow us to be able to walk that purpose out. To the ultimate hope, though, in that one day we will be reunited with our King and our Father who loves us. Jeremiah 29, 11 wasn't, hey, man, everything's going to be great. It was, man, everything's going to be troublesome, but I am with you and I will still prosper you in the end. Yeah. Thank you. For those of you who are going to watch this video online, um, one of the, 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 the men in our church felt like they had a word of just, this is a time to consecrate seeking the Lord first. That I, I 100% am all agree with that. Man, if you don't know Jesus, and that's what I was about to transition to, this, today's the day, guys. You have a Father who loves you, who wants to give, who wants to give everything He has for you and through you so that you can be who you're called to be in this earth. You have the fulfillment that you were meant to have, you were wired to have. You were created imago Dei in the image of this God. And he's a purpose for your life. So even if you're like, hey, Troy, I, I, I gave my life to Jesus a while back, but I just have been distant. I haven't even been like fully like consecrating myself to the Lord. Like today is the day to renew that. Like God, now is the day. Now is the day where I am yours. And from this day forward, every single day of my life, I will, lay, I will lay myself down for you, God. My body is a living sacrifice for your glory. What do you want me to do today? But get in community. <laughs> We've got to do this in community. So if we have some prayer people come up at the front here, I, guys, I want to always close out as we worship and have an opportunity for prayer. If you are in here today, you don't know Jesus, you want to know Jesus come talk with one of these people up here. If you're in here today and you're like, hey, I have been distant from God. I have not been really truly giving my life to him every single day. Come talk with one of us. We wanna pray with you. We wanna challenge you, encourage you, celebrate with you. Or if you're like, hey, I am, have been distant from community and it's been weighing on me. Man, come up and talk with one of us up here. We would love to, to pray with you. Otherwise, we're gonna go close out in one more worship song and the worship team is gonna lead us. So if you would stand to your feet during this worship song, if you feel need to, just come forward. At any point during this worship, you can come right now. Just come forward and receive prayer. Otherwise, we are just gonna go close out in one song of looking to Jesus, looking to God, who's the author and the finisher of our faith. God, thank you that you have a plan for our lives. Thank you, Lord, that you've called each one of us to be men and women that love you, that serve you, and that love this world well. And God, we know that we can only do that through abiding in you, sanctifying ourselves to you, but also by connection to the community around us. So help us, God, lead us. Thank you, Lord, for this faith family. In Jesus' name, Lord, we worship you. Mm -hmm.